Good morning, boys and girls. I'm Eleanor Hawkins, and welcome to Tell a Story Time. I want to read from this little book, A Child's World. A calendar. January brings the snow, makes our feet and fingers glow. February brings the showers. February brings the rain, thaws the frozen lake again. March brings breezes loud and shrill to stir the dancing daffodil. April brings the primrose sweet, scatters flowers at our feet. May brings flocks of pretty lambs skipping by their fleecy dams. June brings flowers, fills the children's hands with posies. Hot July brings cooling apricots and gilly flowers. August brings the sheaves of corn, then the harvest home is born. Warm December brings the fruit, sportsmen then begin to shoot. Fresh October brings the pleasant, then to gather nuts is pleasant. Dull November brings the blast, then the leaves are whirling fast. Chilled December brings the sleep, blazing fire, and Christmas and Christmas tree. And that is by Sarah Coleridge, and this is from A Child's Ver World. And now, boys and girls, I want to read our first story, and the one I've chosen is entitled The Pony Engine. One cold, frosty winter day, the old Toy Town Circus train was standing patiently in the railroad station. Now and then the engine up front let out a smoky, shivery sigh. It was an old, tired engine, and it wondered if it could climb the steep hill up ahead. In the town on the other side of the hill were many children who were waiting to see the circus. Toot toot, toot toot, all aboard. There was a signal to move. The animals and the circus children settled back for a nice ride as the train chugged along slowly. Chug, 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 chug. Now it went faster and whistled louder. Choo-choo, choo-choo. Then all of a sudden, just at the foot of the hill, squeak, bang, boom, the old engine broke down. It stopped so suddenly that everybody was tossed and jolted about. The tired old engine found that it could not pull the train another inch. Oh, how can I reach the next town where the children are waiting to see the circus? The weary old engine cried full of worry. Then swoosh, a giant express engine came whizzing down the next track. Clouds of smoke rushed and gushed from its smokestack. Clang, 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 clang. Clang, clang, it was very proud because it was going to pull a long passenger train with sleeping cars and a dining car. Oh, please stop, cried the weak old engine. I've had a wear and tear breakdown, and I can't budge another inch. Please pull us to the next town. The children are waiting there to see the circus. Oh, the big engine huffed and puffed and blew off steam loudly. It looked down at the old engine and snorted. I can't bother with you. I pull only the finest trains. It puffed some more and went blustering off on the track, leaving the poor, broken old engine helpless. Before long, a long engine came tooting along. It was on its way to the roundhouse where trains go for repairs and rest. Oh, please stop, the old circus engine begged. My wheels won't turn and my steam won't churn. Won't you pull us to the next town? I certainly will not, said the lone engine grumpily. I've done enough. I need rest. And off it went to the roundhouse, grumbling along the tracks. Give me rest, rest, rest. I've done enough, enough, enough. Then another engine came along, pulling a carload of coal. It was rusty and dusty, wheezy and greasy. It groaned wearily and moaned tearfully. 
Just the same, the Toy Town Circus train called out, oh, won't you pull us to the next town? Our engine has broken down, and the children are waiting to see the circus. But the rusty, dusty engine rumbled and grumbled. I'm not strong enough. I could never pull you. I never could. I never could. And then it wept some more with a clankety-clank and a sigh and a groan and bumped along on its way. Now, after a long time, a very small engine came by. It was a pony engine, and it was on its way to the roundhouse after a day's work of pushing freight cars around in the yard. The little pony engine hummed happily along, tooting its squeaky whistle cheerily. How could such a tiny engine be of any help? But the Toy Town Circus train called out, Little Pony Engine, please help us. Our engine has broken down, and the children are waiting in the next town for the circus to come. Won't you please take us there? Hmm, said the Little Pony Engine. You're very heavy, and I'm not very big, but I will try. Yes, I will try, and I think I can. The little pony engine hitched itself to the Toy Town Circus train in place of the old broken down engine. Then the little pony engine tugged and pulled and pulled and tugged some more. The train wheels turned just a little. At last the train began to move slowly, ever so slowly, along the tracks. The little pony engine kept pulling and tugging it strained and struggled and tugged with all of its strength, puffing all the time. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Steadily, it began to move faster and puff more quickly. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Soon it was going up the track more smoothly puffing still faster and faster. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Finally, the little pony engine had pulled the Toy Town Circus train to the top of the hill. The little, en the little en engine looked around proudly. Yes, it had climbed all the way up the steep hill. Down in the valley lay the town where the children were waiting to see the circus. Now they would not be long now they would not be disappointed and the pony engine puffed loud and long I thought I could I thought I could I thought I could As the toy town circus train pulled into the station the little pony engine blew big waves of smoke into the air saying happily to itself I thought I could I thought I could I thought I could and so it was that the little pony engine pulled the Toy Town Circus train over the hill into the next town, and the children saw the best circus they ever did see. And that is the story of the pony engine. And that teaches us to always think we can do something that's very difficult, but thinking, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And now, boys and girls, it's time for me to read from our Big Do You Know book. Stay tuned and listen in just a moment. boys and girls, I'm going to read from our Big Do You Know book. Do you know many famous people were born in January? Do you know there were three presidents born in the month of January? Do you know Richard Nixon, our 37th president, was born on January the 9th, 1913? 
Do you know that Millard Fillmore, our 13th president, was born on January the 7th, 1800? Do you know William McKinley, our 25th president, was born on January the 29th, 1843? Do you know George Washington Carver, born a slave on January the 5th, 1864 in Missouri, became one of America's leading scientists. In his experiments with peanuts, he found more than 300 products that could be made from the peanuts, including wood dyes, soap, linoleum, plastics, flour, paint and ink, and many different kinds of oils. Do you know Albert Schweitzer was born on January the 14th, 1875? He was one of those rare geniuses. He was a theologian, a philosopher, a writer, a medical doctor, and a missionary. Do you know Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was born on January the 15th, 19 and 29 in Atlanta, Georgia. He received many awards for his nonviolent direct action approach in seeking equal civil rights for all Americans. We all remember his famous outstanding speech, I Have a Dream, delivered to more than 200,000 Americans on August the 28th, 1963 in Washington, D.C. And we celebrate his birthday every year, and this year we will be celebrating it on January the 16th, which is a Monday. Do you know Benjamin Franklin was born on January the 17th, 17 and 5 in Boston? He attended school for only two years. He was a very excellent reader. He was jack of all trades. As a publisher, he developed the Pennsylvania Gazette into one of the most successful newspapers in the colonies. And then he wrote and published Poor Richard's Almanac, which contains his witty saying, early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And you know too, he was an inventor. He invented the, the lightning rod, the Franklin stove, and even bifocal glasses. And now, boys and girls, let me remind you to go to any of your libraries in the Craven, Pamlico, Carteret Regional Library System. And there you can check out some very good books on your very own library card. And now stay tuned, and we'll have another story for you in just a moment. Now, boys and girls, I'm going to read you that very old fairy tale entitled Sleeping Beauty. Once upon a time, there was a king and a queen who wished to have a child. At last, the queen had a daughter. Seven fairy godmothers came to the christening of the little princess. Each one gave the princess a gift, as was the custom of the fairies in those days. After the ceremonies were over, everyone returned to the king's palace, where a great feast was prepared for the fairies. A magnificent case of pure gold was set before each fairy. In each case, the fairy found a spoon, knife, and fork, set with diamonds and rubies. As they sat down at the table, there came into, a hall, into the hall a very old fairy whom everyone thought was either dead or enchanted. The king could not furnish her with a case of gold because only seven had been made for the seven fairies. The old fairy was heard to grumble, and when it came time for the old fairy to make her gift 
to the young princess, she said spitefully, when the princess reaches the age of 15, she shall pierce her hand with a spindle and die of the wound. The terrible gift made everyone tremble. At that moment, one of the seven fairy godmothers came forward and said, O king and queen, your daughter shall not die of this disaster. It is true that I cannot undo entirely what the elder fairy has done, but instead of dying, the princess shall merely fall into a deep sleep that will last 100 years. At the end of that time, a king's son will come and awaken her. To avoid the misfortune foretold, foretold by the old king, the king issued a proclamation that every spindle in the kingdom be burned. The young princess grew up without ever seeing a spindle. Thus 15 years passed, and no harm befell the princess. But one day, soon after she was 15, the young princess took a walk through the palace. At the top of the tower, she found a little door. She opened the door, and there inside was an old woman all alone, spinning, spinning with her spindle. The old woman had never heard of the king's order against spindles. Well, what are you doing here, my good woman? asked the princess. I am spinning, my pretty child, said the old woman. Would you like to try it? Oh, yes, said the princess. Let me try. With that, she took the spindle into her hand. But alas, at that moment, she pierced her hand with the spindle and fell into a deep sleep. The old woman cried out for help. People came running from all directions. They threw water upon the princess' face and tried to bring her back to life. But nothing helped, and the princess remained in a deep sleep. Then the king came. He remembered the prediction made by the old fairy, and he had the princess carried into the finest room in the palace. He placed her upon a bed embellished in gold and silver. There she lay, looking like a beautiful angel, her cheeks still pink and her lips rosy. She was breathing very softly. The king commanded that no one disturb her. She was to sleep quietly until the hour of awakening. Then the good fairy who protected the life of the princess came to the kingdom in her fiery chariot drawn by dragons. She touched the king and queen and all the people and animals with her wand and put them all to sleep too. When all were asleep, there sprang up around the palace a thick wood of trees, bushes, and brambles, which hid the palace from view. And thus, 100 years passed. One day, a king's son from a neighboring kingdom was hunting near the palace. Above the thick woods, he saw the topmost battlements of the tower and inquired of his companions about it. When now some said it was an old castle haunted by spirits, others said an old witch lived there. Everyone had a different story according to what he had heard. Finally, a very old man said to the prince, It is now 50 years since my father, who heard it from his father, told me that a beautiful princess lies asleep in that castle. The old tale is that she shall be awakened by a king's son and become his bride. Now the young prince became very excited when he heard those words, and he was determined to rescue the lovely princess who lay enchanted in the palace. As the prince advanced toward the woods, a path suddenly appeared through the bushes and brambles. He walked to the castle and into the courtyard where everyone was asleep. The young prince went on his way through the palace until he came to the royal chamber, and there he saw the princess lying upon her bed. Oh, so beautiful was she that the prince fell down upon his knees beside the bed to gaze upon her, and then he leaned over to kiss the princess. Now his kiss broke the enchantment. The princess awakened and looked at the prince and said, It is you, my prince. You have waited a long while. The prince said that they soon would, 
The prince said that soon he would take her away to be his own bride at his palace. Over the awakening of the princess broke the enchanted spell and the whole palace awoke. The king and queen bustled about and prepared for a great wedding feast and celebration. For three days and nights, the festivities continued and everybody was very happy and rejoiced. And then the prince and princess rode off to their own palace where they lived happily ever after. And that, boys and girls, is the story of Sleeping Beauty. And now, in just a moment, we'll be back with another story. Please stay tuned. Now, boys and girls, I'm going to read you the bedtime book. At night when you're sleepy, mom turns down your bed. But suppose you were some sort of an animal instead. If you were an elephant weighing a ton and you were as old as 101, you would sleep on all fours and you'd feel very fine and quite ready for work the next morning at nine. If you were a turtle, you'd get under your shell. Then you'd huddle and cuddle and sleep very well. If you were a mouse, you would sleep very sound in an attic with funny old things all around. If you were a lamb, you'd have children to pet you. And when it was time, Bo Peep would come get you. If you were a lion, you'd snore loud and clear and no one would ever come anywhere near. If you were a puppy, you'd sleep warm and snug in a round wicker basket all lined with a rug. If you were a kitten, when cold winds were blowing, you'd sleep near the stove with your purr motor going. If you were a horse, it would be quite all right to sleep standing up in your stall through the night. Hay tastes much better to horses than bread, and so the, morning, the next morning you'd eat up your bed. If you were a bear cub, it would be rather shocking to sleep all through Christmas and not hang up your stocking. If you were a fawn, you'd be careful and quick, and you'd sleep where the forest was shady and thick. Now, if you were a stork full of storybook wonder, you'd sleep on one leg with the other tucked under. If you were a bird, you'd not mind the weather with your head halfway hidden neath the mother's best feather. Now, if you were a fox, you would sleep in a ball with your tail tucked around like a soft furry shawl. If you were a seal, you would probably sleep with a good many other seals all in a heap. If you were a squirrel, you'd sleep in the dark in a hole in a tree at the edge of the park. But you are a child, that's as plain as can be, and you'd never, no never, sleep up in a tree. Why, this must be you in your very own bed with a warm, fluffy blanket pulled up to your head. And that is the story, the bedtime book. And boys and girls, I have just time enough to remind you to be visit one of your libraries in the Craven, Pamlico Carter Regional Library System, and check out a very good book on your very own library card. And make this a habit all during the new year. And so now I see it's time for us to close our books of stories for this morning. But you know, we'll be back next Saturday morning. Until then, this is Eleanor Hawkins saying bye-bye for Tell a Story Time.